Good evening, everybody. I'm Alan Levine, and together with Tom Merrill, I run American University's Political Theory Institute, the host for this evening's event. This is the first of five events we're holding this semester. The other four events will be in person on the campus of American University. And they are on September 28th, Mark Edmondson will speak on the age of guilt, the superego in the online world. On October 9th, James Reed will speak on sovereign of a free people. Abraham Lincoln on respecting election results. On October 26th, Tara Isabella Burton will speak on self-made, creating our identities from Da Vinci to the Kardashians. And on November 30th, Diana Schaub will talk on Lincoln's Lyceum Address, Democratic Theory for Citizens. Recordings of all these events will be posted on the Political Theory Institute's website, including tonight's event. Today is our Constitution Day lecture, generously supported by the Jack Miller Center. Thank you, Jack Miller Center. Our speaker today is Jonathan O'Neill, professor of history at Georgia Southern University. O'Neill's most recent book is entitled Conservative Thought and American Constitutionalism Since the New Deal. His book describes all of the post-World War II main schools of conservative thought and what each school thinks about modern developments in each branch of government, as well as developments in federalism and the administrative state. His book just had its first published review, and the reviewer called it, quote, a major intellectual accomplishment, quote, impressive, quote, erudite, and concludes that the book is, quote, unlikely to be surpassed as the definitive guide to conservative thought and American constitutionalism. So high praise for you, Jonathan, and everyone. This is the quality of our uh, speaker today. O'Neill has also authored Originalism in American Law and Politics, a Constitutional History, co-edited four books and written numerous articles, chapters, and reviews. And all in all, he's one of the world experts on the intellectual struggles between progressive and conservative thought in the United States during the 20th and 21st centuries. He's currently writing a book on moderation, deliberation, and compromise in the American constitutional tradition, a study of these once healthy norms of constitutional thought and practice in light of their erosion in recent years. He earned his BA from Colgate University and his PhD from the University of Maryland. Jonathan and I are erstwhile colleagues at the Institute of United States Studies, which was one of the 10 institutes that together made up the University of London School of Advanced Study. Now, I'm happy to call him friend. Jonathan will talk for 30 minutes or so then I'll ask him a few questions before opening it up to the questions from the audience. Audience members, please type your questions in the Q&A feature. So without further, delu uh, without further ado, I am delighted to welcome to AU Jonathan O'Neill to lead our Constitution Day event on the topic, Is the Administrative State Constitutional? Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, if if only virtually. I'm sorry we couldn't make it happen in person. Uh, Alan and I have known each other for a long time uh, and are good friends, so it's it's always a, a pleasure to uh, to renew friendships. Um, and thank you all uh, for joining us out there. And hopefully, we'll we'll get a good discussion going uh, when this is through. So, is the administrative state constitutional? Uh, is the the topic I have been assigned. Um, and so let's start with what is the administrative state? Uh, and I'm going to assume here that we all have a, a basic familiarity, and I won't describe it in a great deal of detail, just the basics. So when we talk about the administrative state, typically Congress creates an administrative agency and delegates some of its own authority to it. The agency makes specific rules and regulations based on the general statement uh, that Congress has announced in the statute that creates it. The agencies are staffed by subject matter experts, lawyers, administrative law judges, uh, all of whom are unelected uh, and most of whom are insulated from removal uh, by civil service protections. These people apply, administer the law, 
uh, but not simply by making rules derived from the statute. They also investigate violations of those rules and dispense punishments. And in turn, they adjudicate uh, the claims of regulated parties when they are contesting the application of the rules to them. So understood in this way, it's pretty clear that the administrative state is in serious tension uh, with constitutional principles. Its functionaries exercise legal authority, but they are not responsible to the electorate. And usually they cannot be removed by the president, absent gross malfeasance, theft, incompetence. And again, these agencies regulate by mixing powers that Americans have always tried to separate. Uh, in one institution are combined legislative, executive, and judicial functions. Agencies issue the rules of law, police those rules, and adjudicate challenges to them. There are dozens of these agencies, maybe hundreds, uh, regulating everything under the sun. No one is quite sure how many agencies there actually are. It depends in somewhat technically how you uh, define them. Some are housed in an executive branch department, uh, but others are so-called independent agencies who don't report to anyone in the executive branch. And uh, together, all of these agencies issue thousands of regulations a year. You find them in the Federal Register and uh, they have trillions of dollars of economic impact on the nation. So given what I've just said, it's not hard to beat up uh, on the administrative state. It's pretty easy, right? Who likes bureaucrats? Everyone raise your hand, right? Uh, if we then are to take a literal or even a strict reading uh, of the constitution, it seems pretty clear that today's administrative state is unconstitutional insofar as it's not contemplated by the text that the founders left us. So, does this mean that some kind of sub salentio constitutional revolution has occurred, maybe a coup d'etat? Is it high time to man the barricades against such subversive forces as the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Social Security Administration? Perhaps the Food and Drug Administration or the Environmental Protection Agency? I think not. But if that's the correct answer, uh, we must ask ourselves why taking such an action uh, would be unrealistic, ineffectual, and probably uh, more than a little bit crazy. And that line of thinking gets us around to a more nuanced uh, understanding of what it might mean to regard the administrative state as constitutionally legitimate, even if it's enduringly problematic. The reality is that we've had the administrative state uh, in some version for nearly 140 years. If one takes as a starting point only the Congress's creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887, with its vague remit to see that railroad, railroad rates were just and reasonable. Now, we might think that that delegation to the ICC was incredibly vague, and therefore it was dangerous and irresponsible, but certainly uh, the railroads who protested the regulations in court took that approach. But there are two larger points here, uh, which I will come back, I think, thematically as we go on. No regulatory scheme of any complexity can avoid delegation by the legislature to some bureaucrat, who then must apply to inevitably apply inevitably generally stated principles to novel, unforeseen, and often complicated fact situations. Congress is simply not constituted to address the vast particulars of railroads, medicines, pollution, nuclear energy, etc. Now, to support this, uh, this basic idea, we can evoke uh, two chief justices, John Marshall and William Howard Taft, neither of whom is known to be a wild-eyed progressive statist. Uh, there is a, a, an opinion from 1825, uh, well known to administrative law types, called Wayman versus Southard. It's actually a pretty complex opinion, which I won't get into, but it, it's, a, it's a jurisdictional conflict between the federal judiciary and the state judiciary uh, when the state is trying to control uh, the actions of federal courts within the borders of the state. And one of the things that, that, that uh, Marshall has to address is, can Congress delegate to the judiciary uh, the, the ability to let the judiciary come up with their own processes and forms of procedure? And this is what Marshall says when he's for, for the first time really addressing this. The line has not been exactly drawn, which separates those important subjects, which must be entirely regulated by the legislature itself, from those of less interest, in which a general provision may be made, and power given to those who are, act, who are to act under such general provisions to fill up the details. So here is the great Chief Justice recognizing uh, that you will have delegation and someone's going to have to, quote, fill up the details. 
Fast forward about a century uh, to another case, uh, J.W. Hampton versus the United States. This is a case about delegation to the president uh, to implement tariff rates, essentially to regulate uh, protective tariffs uh, to, to protect American uh, domestic manufacturers. And Taft uh, says this about delegation. If Congress shall lay down a legislative in a legislative act an intelligible principle, to which the person or body authorized to fix such rates is directed to conform, such legislative action is not forbid a forbidden delegation of legislative power. But it's thought wise to vary the customs duties according to changing conditions of production at home and abroad. It may authorize the chief executive to carry out this purpose. So again, we can argue, what is the intelligible principle? Is the principle intelligible? Uh, we can argue about how spe excuse me, specific the delegation should be. But I don't think we can avoid the necessity of delegation. So the most uh, pitched battle over the administrative state, of course, came and its greatest victory came in the New Deal. The administration of Franklin Roosevelt uh, was creating numerous new federal agencies in the 1930s and 40s to contend with the massive economic social dislocations of the Great Depression. Now, I don't want to go into the whole uh, constitutional story of the New Deal here. Um, but I am going to come back to uh, an aspect of it later on. What I really want to do with reference to the New Deal uh, is, is to take the measure of the shift that it creates, and indeed the permanence of that shift, uh, as setting the sort of ground zero uh, of constitutionalism in its wake. And there's a, a, a charming way to do this. Uh, uh, is by quoting uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who was the first Republican president after the New Deal, um, and, a, and a letter that Eisenhower writes to his brother uh, Edgar in 1954, the, as the Republican Party is, is basically having an internal uh, fight about, now that it's back in power, is it going to try to dismantle the New Deal? Um, and he's getting some heat from his brother that, you know, your administration is not really doing what a lot of Republicans think think that it should do. And this is the way that uh, he responds to his brother in November of 1954. Should any political party attempt to establish, attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There is a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes you can do these things. Their number is negligible and they are stupid, <laughs> says Eisenhower. So I think this is the political meaning of the victory uh, uh, of the administrative state in the New Deal. And part of what explains why it would be quixotic and, and more or less impossible to try to undo, undo much of what the New Deal achieved. Now, I am not claiming uh, that that observation directly meets the constitutional problems of the New Deal, or excuse me, of the administrative state. But it is a political reality that any constitutional reformers in our day uh, would have to contend with. And this reality grows only more entrenched uh, as the 20th century goes on, and, and with it the paradox of a political fait accompli that is nonetheless constitutionally problematic. Uh, one more observation on this point before I move on. Um, in, from the 1980s by the great conservative sociologist Robert Nisbet, uh, who is assessing uh, American society in his Jefferson lecture of 1988. And, and amid the heated political uh, uh, and anti-statist uh, rhetoric of the Reagan era, when it seems like the Reagan revolution may be taking aim at the administrative state again, it's certainly talking that way. Uh, and, and Nisbet puts it this way. Americans had by this point well and truly gotten used to the liberal provider state and the bureaucracy as the bearer of goodies. Sure, it was still true that our constitutional principles meant that we responded to it, often by cursing it, deriding it, abhorring it. And then he says, but we are constantly beckoning it to us with one hand. So I think that is the kind of perspective that we must take in assessing the administrative state. Americans have broadly accepted the permanence, its permanence since the New Deal. If not, it's every new expansion or its specific actions in particular cases. And two, delegation of legislative authority or, or legal authority to bureaucrats and bureaucrats exercising political discretion. This is inevitable and unavoidable. So given that that is our circumstance, how are we to answer the question of the constitutionality of the administrative state? 
I think we must concede that even though it is here and it has been accepted for a long time, it is not constitutional according to a strict reading of the documentary constitution. Our task then uh, must be, as it has been for a long time, to constitutionalize it as much as possible. We do this by working into its operations uh, a greater accord with the principles of constitutionalism. An influential scholar of public administration, David Rosenblum, who taught at American University for a long time, describes this as a process of retrofitting the administrative state to the constitutional system. Now, that seems to me uh, very much what occurred at the very tail end of the New Deal in 1946 with the creation of two very important laws. Um, one of these is the Administrative Procedure Act, which brought at least some standards of procedure and conduct, conduct to the administrative agencies. The other was the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946, in which Congress tries to uh, reorganize itself to better contend with and oversee the bureaucracy. So what I want to do now is take a, a couple minutes and, and explain these and, and think about them uh, and their significance in a bit more detail. The first thing to recognize here is that this achievement in 1946 uh, comes after a substantial period of conflict and interbranch dialogue, all the while the Supreme Court, too, weighing in on various aspects of administrative law. The constitutional dynamic of negotiation and compromise ensued because nobody's quite sure how to do this. There's no cookbook for integrating regulatory bureaucracies into the constitutional structure. This is challenge is complicated by depression, war, and the rise of totalitarianism. And so the task is to ameliorate the, the dislocations of, of social and economic modernity with new forms of government power that still can be reconciled to constitutional government. And that task is, is very much alive in the minds of people at the time as uh, one that has to be met. The innovation has to be done. It has to be constitutionalized, reconciled to constitutionalism, because the other alternative is fascism and communism, which are proclaiming the death of liberal constitutionalism as incapable of adjusting to uh, modern social reality. So there's this, these are the stakes. Um, so there's this interbranch con contest that goes on in the 30s and 40s. What does the executive branch want? Uh, agencies administered as uh, efficiently and expeditiously as possible, preferably under the ultimate control of the president. This is based on the assumption that they merely exercise scientific expertise and managerial efficiency, and bureaucrats should function with as little interference as possible. Um, this, that's a word that the administrative state always casts at others, interference, um, and that courts should basically defer to their actions. Congress, wants more safeguards for those being regulated, greater transparency, more regular procedure, stronger evidentiary standards for decision-making. It also wants more robust judicial review of the actions of agencies. So all of these conflicting imperatives are playing out for several years during the New Deal and through several rounds of institutional serve and volley until President Truman finally signs the APA in 1946. So in this sense, uh, the constitutional um, system, constitutional politics and contestation between the branches is addressing the constitutional problems of the administrative state. So what does the APA do? Uh, briefly, in some ways, it, it, it kind of codifies best practices that agencies had been evolving at the time, but it adds new things as well. Agencies, and so one of the problems before the APA is from the perspective of critics is a lot of people think that the agencies are just kind of a black box. We don't really know their decision-making process, the criteria they use, what are rules they're abiding on, what are the standards of evidence that are actually going to be applied to us. So one of the jobs of the APA is to try to routinize uh, uh, um, procedures a bit more and to make them more disciplined. So agencies have to publish descriptions of their structure, their organization, general statements of their policies, their official decisions, they can still make rules informally, but they have to be more public and particip participatory about it so that regulated parties uh, have to receive notice of, a, of an impending rule. They can then comment on it, um, and agencies have to announce a rule and give a legal basis for it uh, after input from the parties and give a concise general statement of its basis and purpose. 
other rulemaking, more formal rulemaking and adjudication is also tightened up a bit, um, uh, given a clearer processes and, and higher standards of evidence. Um, and there's also an attempt to separate more fully uh, people in the agency who prosecute regulated parties and those who judge in, uh, um, contests uh, that arise from those prosecutions. And then finally, the the APA uh, seemingly gives a, a, a large remit for judicial review to the, uh, the the court system, and the assumption is that the courts would be the the final forum for reviewing the constitutionality of what the agencies do. So most contemporaries understand the APA as non-revolutionary, as a restatement of things that needed uh, declaration and a writing, and it really is a success insofar as it convinces. Uh, in general, people that the uh, the, the administrative is being, state is being brought within the discipline of rule of rule of law values um, and due process. Uh, Congress generally regards it as a pioneer effort, one that needs to be built on as time goes on. Um, but it, it is a success insofar as more constitutional process procedure principles brought to bear on the administrative state. The Legislative Reorganization Act, which is the Companion Act uh, to the APA, also passed in 1946, um, is Congress trying to change the way it functions to better contend with the administrative state. Um, and then it does a number of things. Uh, one of these, uh, the probably the most significant of these is um, it alters its own structure to correspond with the way that administrative agencies are uh functioned and the problems that they're pointed at. So the committee system itself is then meant to mirror the structure of the agencies so that Congress can better oversee the agencies and the power that is delegated to them. It also tightens up jurisdiction in various ways. Um, and the phrase that comes out of uh, the, the LRA, the Legislative Reorganization Act, is that the goal then is to exercise continuous watchfulness over the bureaucracy. It also uh, gives more money uh, to hire experts uh, on committees, clerical staff, subject matter experts. It also increases the funding of the Legislative Reference Service, which becomes ultimately uh, the Congressional Research Service. And that doesn't sound all, like all that much, but the point is uh, that Congress wants not to depend on the agencies for data, knowledge, and perspective when it's trying to oversee them. It wants its own independent sources of information. Um, so people associated with the LRA actually wanted to go much further uh, and, and do a number of other things, which I won't go into those as in a much deal, detail as I originally planned. Um, but it is trying to come up with ways of changing the budget process, uh, of better articulating the, the, the position of the majority party. Um, the overall goal of these other reforms is to try to strengthen con Congress as an institution so that it can confront more concertedly, more institutionally, the executive branch and the agencies. Um, but the, the attempt to coordinate uh, um, activities inside Congress and present more of a united front to the executive doesn't work. Um, uh, it doesn't happen because members of Congress at the time are invested in the way things that already uh, are being done. So some of these things would have truncated the maneuverability and the power of leaders. Uh, the seniority system for committee chairs is, is not reformed. Um, so although the, there, the number of committees during this reform actually comes down because you still have the seniority system for choosing chairs, the power of committee chairs actually goes up. Um, the change in the budget process doesn't work because it would have interfered with the actions of appropriation committees and people don't want to give up their authority there. So this settlement of 1946, because of these limitations, it doesn't go as far uh, as uh, overseeing the administrative state as what people originally had hoped that it would. Um, but I still want to insist that the APA together with the LRA are, are the basis uh, of reforms that were undertaken so that more constitutional values, especially consent, representation, separation of powers, due process values are, 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 are both passed upon the administrative state and integrated into its operations. So Congress makes the bureaucracy more routinized and accountable, and at the same time, it changes itself to better monitor modern bureaucratic government. So 
there is a profound sense uh, that the settlement of 1946 and all of the preceding strife and contestation that it resolves defines what we might call a constitutional adaptation or adjustment. Its substance was that Congress accepted the administrative state while constitutionally constraining and supervising it. So here, uh, and put in mind uh, of a famous quotation by Edmund Burke, a state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. Without such means of conservation, it might even risk that the loss to that part of the Constitution, which it most wished most religiously to preserve. So building on this observation of Burke, I think it's a good time to state more directly the conception of constitutionalism that's been implicit in my remarks so far. But before I do that, I will give an, an obligatory nod to this more textualist, formalist conception of constitutionalism we're all familiar with, which insists on limited government, responsible government for the sake of individual liberty. Of course, in America with a written constitution, that will always be relevant. We'll always value the written constitution, the norms of separation of powers, federalism, the rule of law. But constitutional government is also about effective government. Uh, and the exercise of power for the common good. If enough people think that factions or interests in society are exploiting or abusing everyday citizens, those citizens and their representatives will demand that government act. There's no better statement of this. Uh, another quotation uh, from Hamilton and Federalist 25, I'm sure some of you know it, um, dramatizes this point. Nations pay little regard to rules and maxims that are calculated in their very nature to run counter to the necessities of society. Wise politicians will be cautious about fettering government with restrictions that cannot be observed. That is to say, formalism and rule of law values will bend when society at large uh, deems it a necessity or justice. And I think things got to this point in the New Deal. When the established constitutional order uh, confronted the administrative state, the result, though, I, I am arguing, was not constitutional revolution or regime change, but a hard-fought and messy adaptation that is signified by this settlement of 1946. Now, uh, how well this constitutional adaptation worked out over time, how the administrative state evolved, is the story of the last 75 years. It is a complicated and ongoing story, uh, that we cannot fully engage here. I, again, I'm a historian. Administrative law gets very messy and very technical very quickly. Um, and without going into that full 75-year history since the New Deal, I would insist that the tension between, between constitutionalism and the administrative state endures all through the ensuing period. That is the story of its history over the last 75 years, is the continued tension. Now, I will add uh, one more conceptual point that I think is helpful for thinking about the dynamic in play here. Um, the administrative state was successfully installed in the New Deal, but the New Dealers did not amend the Constitution. This is a problem in a regime with a written Constitution, and yes, a formal amendment procedure in Article 5. Instead, I say the administrative state washed over the established constitutional order without wholly displacing it. This means that the old order persists beneath and within the new one, and it's still able to assert its principles to critique and limit the new order. So if we think of these two things as orders or systems of authority, the key point is that they abut and contest one another, and this generates constitutional politics. So amid the ascendance of the administrative state, then the written formal textualist constitution still exists as a source of principles and doctrines that are capable of disciplining the new order. And I think that's where we are today. Um, and that that, to some extent, is the theme of the 75 years since the New Deal. And today, of course, we are witnessing our politics uh, uh, contend more pointedly with limiting, constraining, constitutionalizing the administrative state. This is happening on the court, but of course, not only there. So I want to end with a few observations uh, under the heading of what is to be done. Um, I hasten to add that, that while that is useful and pertinent, uh, the political feasibility of any given reform is a different question than what might logically or constitutionally be done. Right? Um, 
But I would I would also add that uh, if any reforms do succeed, I predict that neither the court uh, nor anyone else will wholly uproot the administrative state, if for no other reason than most citizens and politicians wouldn't stand for it. So uh, let's start with things that Congress might do. Uh, the most basic thing that Congress can do is to assert more control over the regulatory bureaucracies it has created and empowered. Most fundamentally, uh, perhaps most unrealistically, this would entail less delegation via legal standards that allow agencies to govern as they wish. Not only would this change be in accord with Congress's authority and responsibility to set legal norms, less delegation would induce more compromise and moderation in the laws that are passed. A compulsion to arrive at clearer standards from amid diversity and disagreement would produce laws whose content would be more moderate than what people at the extremes at either pole would prefer. Um, so that is, I think, is the conceptually and constitutionally the cleanest solution to the, the constitution, the, the core constitutional problem of the administrative state. Another uh, more precise solution that has been proposed over the past decade is a thing known as the RAINS Act, RAINS as in holding the RAINS, and the acronym stands for Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny. And basically what we do is we require prior congressional approval for any major uh, agency rule before it could take effect. Major being defined as a high dollar economic impact, say $100 million. Um, that those kind of regulations would have to be pre-approved by a vote in Congress before they could go into effect. Now, RAINS would be a significant tool in the congressional arsenal, uh, but it hasn't passed, but it also has not gone away. It keeps coming up in these discussions. Another proposal uh, out there would be that Congress could legislate sunset provisions on new rules. Um, that any going forward, any new rule uh, um, would have to have a sunset provision in it. And when that sunset provision came, it would have to be reevaluated and its effects measure, measured before it would uh, be renewed and continue. So no automatic forever rules absent measurement of their effects. Uh, Congress could also compel agencies uh, uh, who want to issue new regulations to uh, attach a cost benefit analysis to them by the agency itself to, in order to sort of make the evaluation of them more empirical instead of expecting automatic obedience. And one last, and this is a bit more technical, uh, but it's floating around in the think tank world and among scholars, uh, is what something that is called uh, the separate function model of agency adjudication. And it's, it's not as complicated as it might sound. Under this framework, uh, the judging of challenges to an agency action is invested in a principal officer other than the ones who are prosecuting the alleged rule breakers. So for a good example of this is OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Congress delegated prosecuting functions to the Labor Department and judging responsibilities to this thing called the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. So separating uh, it is kind of classic separation of powers functions uh, more. Another uh, that's this is done with mine safety regulations as well. So the idea here is to try to separate the functions even more than what was uh, done in the original APA in 1946. Uh, and now finally uh, and briefly on to the, the judiciary, things that it is doing already. And what it is doing is actually re-evaluating uh, its own relationship to the administrative state. Primarily by its inclination, this court to show less deference to administrative agencies. Even more specifically, it's revisiting the Chevron doctrine. Uh, this doctrine is from a famous 1984 decision in which the court said that if there was ambiguity uh, in the, the statute that an agency was empowered to imply, if there was a question about how much power was really delegated, the court would generally defer to the agency's own interpretation of the law instead of the court asserting its own interpretation. Now, gradually, the effect that that had uh, was that agencies began to claim more ambiguity and generality and then to act as they chose. So Chevron still stands, but the court is nibbling at it. Uh, and it's beginning to interpret directly for itself claims of agencies who allege an emancipating ambiguity or generality in their statute. This happened uh, recently in the in the West Virginia versus EPA decision. 
the, the court said that the EPA leaned too heavily on a supposedly uh, vague part of its statute to essentially compel uh, the, the transformation of the domestic energy energy. Uh, energy uh, system by making uh, the use of coal prohibitively expensive. The court deemed that uh, an impermissible because it, such a major question with such far-reaching economic effects could not legitimately rest on such a flimsy uh, and ambiguous foundation. This is what the Congress wanted the agency to do, says the court. If it attended such a large delegation, it would have to authorize it more explicitly. So recently, this has come to be referred to as the major questions doctrine, and it is now a hot and very controversial topic at the very center of debate about the administrative state. And the court has used the major uh, questions doctrine recently in other high profile cases, maybe uh, the most uh, being the case in which it denied that the Centers for Disease Control could require an ongoing uh, national eviction moratorium during COVID. It says that the CDC basically doesn't have the authority to cancel rent uh, in this circumstance. Uh, there's another uh, case in which it said that OSHA's statute couldn't be read to allow it to mandate vaccines. So the court uh, is, is has sometimes been accused of just in, uh, creating the whole the, the major questions doctrine out of whole cloth and using it to obstruct good public policy. But what I think it's really trying to do is to get Congress to take more responsibility for public policy and for directing the administrative state. So in the EPA decision, uh, Justice Roberts says that the major question doctrine refers to an identifiable body of law that has developed over a long time and is pointed at this basic problem, that which keeps recurring. Agencies asserting highly consequential power beyond what Congress could reasonably be understood to have granted. Now, I think that's a good uh, place to end because it gets us back at our current moment with current issues to some of the key issues that are at stake in the administrative state. Congress must delegate some power over details to people in the future, but accountability and self-government are endangered if it delegates too much or if bureaucrats can claim that it has. This is the problem the court is now wading into again, and there's no simple solution. So is today's administrative state unconstitutional? Certainly, uh, or is it constitutional? I should phrase the question correctly. Certainly not by a strict reading of the constitutional text. But the fact is that we have it, and we've had it for much of our history. And as much as we may find it uncomfortable to admit, we need it. And we need it to do much of what it does. So our task is to bring more constitutional principles to bear on it, and certainly more than there have been for much of our history. That's the conclusion I arrive at. Um, I hope I have shed some light on these challenges in what is surely going to be an ongoing story. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. That's a lot to uh, to take in. Uh, first, I want to remind the audience to please uh, post your questions in the Q&A function, okay? Uh, we've got a lot of time left. And uh, I'm counting on you all to uh, ask some some good questions or just to, you know, ponder the the mysteries of the administrative state. Um, and uh, OK. Um, so, Jonathan, I, I want to ask you a few questions first. And I want to start with where you kind of where you ended, where that we need this. And on the one hand. I don't dispute that at all, right? Um, I want uh, nuclear fuel to be regulated. I don't want it to be stolen and gotten in the hands of terrorists or to for there to be an accident and have it end up in water, right? Um, you know, uh, I want my food to be safe. When I take drugs, I want to make sure that I'm getting what I need and, and that it's not contaminated, right? So... We need all of that. I'm wondering if you, to, I don't know if you know this, but to, to go back in time, where did all of, when, where and when and why did all of these great needs arise, right? Because presumably at the beginning of the polity, um, you know, we, we didn't want there to be poor people either. And we, we wanted sick people to get help. But I guess at the beginning of the polity, there was more of a sense of 
charity take being responsible for these things as opposed to government and people being responsible for themselves right and i guess there was always land out there um to be taken um and um and and so you know pe people didn't need to be starving right but it does it does that all do all of these things change with as the world becomes more industrialized and technologized and urbanized and right so if you tell me now hey levine you, you don't got a job so so go farm for yourself i'm going to starve because i don't know how to farm i mean so wh where does all this come from originally yeah, uh, and I, I think you're you're you know you're you're buzzing around the 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 right themes. I mean, you know, a natural question to ask is you know well, what does it look like in the 19th century and uh, or in, in the founding era? Um, and uh, one short answer is a lot more of it is at the local level uh, and and done by states, right? So of course this doesn't raise the the same level of questions about uh, accountability. Um, uh, or distance, right? Uh, um, and 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 at the same time, of course, government is is doing far less in general, right? Um, and so the sort of things that are administered are are you know much more mundane. Um, uh, roads, tariffs, postal roads, um, and and so the kind of uh, there's always inevitably discretion in delegation, but the, the 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 sort of magnitude or kind of discretion is far far less. And uh, when there are, are contests, they are typically resolved in an actual real court, right? Uh, as opposed to an administrative agency that is 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 created later. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think the uh, the base level answer to your question, um, and this is pretty much the answer that the uh, the the progressives cum new dealers give is you know modern economies and societies are are just different more complex more more intermingled less respective of local borders or federal state distinctions um and and interwoven um that it, it, the, the old model is just ineffectual and and you you can, uh, uh, you, you mentioned well. There's always more land out there, right? And and uh, famously, in one of the uh, uh, speeches that Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, gives at the beginning of the New Deal, he references Franklin Jackson, Frederick Jackson Turner, and uh, and the frontier thesis that you know one of the the uh, the safety valves for American society, said Turner, in the end of the 19th century, had always been that there's more land out there that people can just go and farm, and well, it's over by the time you get to 1890, 1900, right? And Roosevelt actually references this in one of his speeches when he uh, is saying, uh, the day of enlightened administration has come. Now we have the plant, the stocks in hand. There's no more running from the fact that we need to start being more concerned about regulating and administering what we do have instead of just taking the safety valve that we always have had. So it's a sort of, it's a it's a way of marking that the new dealers themselves understood the problem in this way, right? And 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 that makes sense in terms of, I mean, the real issue here is sort of like individual responsibility. You, you hear that phrase among conservatives today, right? People should be more responsible for themselves as opposed to the state looking after them. But the argument here is that the world has become more complex and so interdependent that people are suffering because of no fault of their own, right? Someone somewhere else makes a decision and, and other people who know nothing about them, have never met that person, that person who made the decision has never met them, those people are suffering. And as a result of those complicated, interdependent, interrelated systems, you need some other complicated, interdependent system to protect those people, and that's the federal government. Yeah, I mean, I and I think this is a, an irreducible problem at the core of it. And I and I, you know, I admit that in in, in serious ways, I find it, you know, 
unsatisfying, right? Uh, in so far as you know, as I said in the talk, I mean that, that really doesn't resolve the uh, the particularities or the niceties of constitutionality, right? What it is is a massive fact that gets to the questions that Hamilton raises in Federalist Twenty Five about justice and necessity, which is that that. Uh, people will chuck your constitution out if if it thinks that it's the result is starvation in the street, right? And and if, if you really think that you know some version of that problem is, is true, I mean I think that the New Dealers oversold uh, to some extent the crisis uh, for their own political purposes as you would expect them to do. But I don't think you can you can deny that the constitutional system had to face this new socioeconomic reality in a way that it heretofore had not done a sufficient job of doing. Okay, good. So then the next question I want to ask is, why didn't they pass constitutional amendments to do this? Uh, so so let's, let's concede now that the world has changed and government has to get involved and do things that up until that moment in time, people thought the federal government didn't have the constitutional right to do. So why yeah, not so change the constitution at the same time as you're doing those needed things? This is a, of course, this is a serious question. Um, the the, the uh, short answer from Franklin Roosevelt is it takes too long. <laughs> I mean that honestly is the answer, right? I mean it it, it doesn't he does it takes too long, and I don't want to be reliant on the amount of time or the contingency it might take the required number of states to ratify. We don't have that much time. The emergency is on, right? That's basically the argument that the Roosevelt administration gives. Now, interestingly, uh, Roosevelt, a uh, great political rhetorician, and and tactician that he was, when you read Roosevelt's speeches, um, you know, sometimes he will say uh, the Constitution needs to be read in a 20th century way, um, the, and we don't have the judges who can do that. And then he'll say that the, the Constitution is not the problem. Uh, it's the way that it's being interpreted or read that is the problem. We don't need to change the Constitution. There's plenty of room within the Constitution to address and attend to the challenges that we confront. So politically, one of the things that Roosevelt is doing is he doesn't want to concede the ground to his enemies that I'm attacking the Constitution. The Constitution is ineffectual. It's anachronized. No, 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 no. Plenty of room within its confines to do what needs to be done, right? And so this creates the dynamic that I was referring to about these, you know, the orders contesting each other yeah. and, the, and the problem that you get when you don't amend, right? Um, and I think that's, you know, the more I've, I've studied this and thought about it, I think that this is the way that you need to, to understand the dynamic, right? Is uh, the, the, the the lack of amendments will always kind of create the opportunity to recur to the logic and principles of the old order to try to discipline and, and defend the administrative state. Um, but it's always a loser politically to say, yeah, we're innovating. The Constitution's an anachronism. We're just, we're done with it. No one's going to say that, including Roosevelt, who didn't say it. Right. So, so I don't know, phrases like a more perfect union or the, uh, any of the many of those other phrases in the preamble that talk about the common good could just sort of point to that kind of thing in order to justify it. Yeah, and I think and and I think you know when you look at the the New Deal rhetoric, there are people saying things like that, right? That the the, the Constitution needs to be um, uh, read in this way, right? And you see, and some of this discussion more you know more technically and philosophically, you know, does get to. Uh, Roosevelt's project of redefining the concept of a right as well, right? And so the right becomes less the the classic and limited uh, Lockean triad yeah. and more to something that is about um, well, social security, right? Uh, and and that that and but again, you know the the other side of that argument is to some extent it's a redefinition, but it's still in the language of a right because in America you can't really not talk in the language of rights. And, and, and Roosevelt, of course, sees this. 
and and I remember that uh, uh, many of the New Deal programs were originally struck down by the Supreme Court on a five to four vote as unconstitutional. And then uh, one of the judges changed his mind sort of about the whole program. And and wrote, then after that, Roosevelt won all the cases five to four. So maybe if that guy had held out, Roosevelt would have had to take the the harder, longer path to uh, to get an amendment or something. To right? Is that yeah, yeah, maybe? And there's been uh, um, you know one of the things that's happened actually in constitutional history about this the, the so called New Deal revolution is there's been this wave of revisionism uh, that says. Um, yes, these these guys kind of switched their votes in 1937, uh, seemingly from what they were before. But when you actually go and look at it, this has become some of because some of the the facts are different in the different in these cases. They didn't just cave into political pressure. There's actually a long series of kind of doctrinal evolution. Um, and so even the revolution itself is not that revolutionary. It's an adaptation within the doctrines of the Supreme Court that is kind of tipped or pushed at the last minute by the political conflict of the court packing controversy. And I like that kind of argument because it conduces to the broader kind of argument that I'm trying to make about um, constitutional adaptation uh, uh, and sort of the, the contestation of the branches in the APA and the LRA as that is that is constitutional politics compromise the institutions clashing against each other to try to come up with a way of dealing with this new situation within the the, the confines of the system as they understand it and you can't you can never forget the fact that congress in 1946 is and it is Congress who, who created many of these agencies. It's Congress in 1946 who is trying to cohere and discipline and organize them, which is to say that the, the administrative state is not being shoved down the institution that is uh, the throat of the institution that is to represent the people. It is being sort of, of, of welcomed and accepted and adapted and integrated into the system by Congress, right? And we, I don't think I don't think we should ever forget that it's not this kind of of you know thing that springs from the head of Zeus out of nowhere. It's that the representatives and and the evolution of constitutional law are dealing with it and contending with it over a period of decades. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to some questions. I'm going to take some student questions first. And so please, everyone in the audience, there's a lot of you out there. Please uh, post your questions and or comments um, in the Q and A feature. Uh, this is from August Clark. He writes, it seems that the idea of bureaucracy and even the word as such got a bad rap last century and for some very good reasons. My questions are, is there anything bureaucracy can do now to convince us that its disturbing historical capabilities are truly behind us? Is shedding itself of this past worthwhile if true liberals believers in the constitution desire a non-bureaucratic way of life? That's a big one. Um, are, are there positive virtues of bureaucracy um, besides uh, what we might call the necessity or inescapability of it. Um, and, and I guess to some extent, my, my, my response to that, it go, again, is it goes to my understanding of this whole problem, which is that constitu the, the, the Congress as a body that is supposed to represent clashing interests and, and cohere something like a general principle out of them, by a compromise moderation, that kind of institution uh, simply cannot weigh in on the, the level of particularity of things that we want regulated in a modern society, right? And so that the positive virtue of democracy, it is, it is constituted and functions to achieve this end that we want done and simply cannot have one of our other institutions take on. If Congress were to regulate everything that, that uh, in, in its uh, minuteness that needed regulating, it, 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 there aren't enough hours in the day, right, to to write a detailed statute for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or you know the regulation of, of plastics or any other million things you could name, right? It's impossible. 
So, I mean, I, I think that that is a, a, a positive virtue of democracy. Um, I refresh my memory. There's another component to the question. But I'm yeah, not sure so, so bureaucracy has a bad name. Is there anything that bureaucrats or bureaucracy as such can can do for itself to redeem it in the eyes of the public? Well, or is it I always going to be a, a bad thing. Yeah. So I've thought about this, and somebody, one of the students earlier, brought up uh, John Rohr, uh, R O H R, uh, um, who was quoted in one of the articles that we had them read. And when I first, and so Rohr was, was a well-known uh, administrative uh, law, administrative, he was a political scientist, political theorist, political theorist. but he, he studied the administrative state for a long time uh, and uh, wrote some important books about it and tried to work with people who sort of contended with the constitutional rate issues it raised at one of the deepest levels. And one of the things that Rohr says, uh, and I'm informed by his thinking, when I first started thinking about it, I was like, ah, this guy's, you know, kind of unserious pie in the sky when he makes this recommendation. But this re his recommendation is, look, as I've said, you're not going to stop delegation. You can't stop delegation. And you cannot stop discretion at, at the point of application of a general statute. So what should, what can we do with these bureaucrats? And Rohr's answer is, give them a proper constitutional education, right? That they should be immersed in the values of the founders uh, via literally educational seminars and activities. They should read canonical Supreme Court decisions. So when the moment comes at the point of discretion to make a choice, they are informed and imbued with the values of the regime. And that this, as a matter of constitutional education, is one of the tools that we could think of um, to, to discipline them in an appropriately constitutional way, but also in a way that citizens can respect. Now, I used to kind of think that that was you know, silly and, 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 and unserious, but now I'm not so sure, right, <laughs> given the, the inevitability of the things that you can't get away from in this situation. You know, I'd propose education like that for members of the three branches as well, <laughs> including elected representatives. But <laughs> um, yeah, okay. okay. So, so, so that would help fix the problem. And and anything that you know uh, the bureaucrats can do to just make us have a more positive feeling towards them, or is it basically just fix their behavior? That's Uh, I mean, I I don't, I mean, I'm not summoning a lot on, on the last point, other than there's one other kind of recognition, which is these people are not from Mars. A lot of them are your neighbors, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they're fellow citizens, many of them well-educated and honest, right? And so, I I, I mean, I think it's a, a, a doing something that they, at this point, are legally and constitutionally constituted to do. Right. So, I mean, I think it's a mistake to think, again, that this is some alien invasion. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and so there's a kind of a, a sort of base level uh, citizenly acceptance, I think. OK, thank but you. As far as what they themselves could do, I, I, I'm less sure. Uh, we have a question from an AU grad student, Anthony Pantalone. Are there any constitutional implications when an administrative state agency is found to have violated the constitutional rights of an American? Uh, yes, uh, sometimes they can. Uh, the way I understand some of these statutes is some uh, people can be hold can be held individually liable, yeah. right? Uh, and and uh, and therefore, you know, it becomes incumbent on the federal government to offer some defense of this person's action for what is essence a constitutional tort, right? For violating someone's constitutional rights in the performance of of your official duties. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 I don't know that end of it very well, but I know such things exist and have happened. Uh, I don't think I could sum a particular example, um, but I mean, there are also cases where. Um, there's some recent, we didn't talk about removal that much, presidential removal, but uh, the, the court is weighing back into this. And there was a recent case, um, the, uh, what is that? I always get the acronym wrong. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, which was uh, uh, emerged, I think originally out of the Dodd-Frank Act, that the head administrator of this bureau was essentially too insulated from presidential removal and accountability, 
right? And that it's a constitutional violation to to have this person or or any person similarly situated to be utterly immune from the reach of the president, the pre president's capacity to fire him. So that this bureau still exists and it's still regulating, but the court said in a recent opinion, this person can't be immune from presidential removal given the way uh, that this this institution is created. Okay, thanks. And it strikes you there, there's a connection between, or a possible connection between your answers to those two que first two questions, that uh, a way to incentivize bureaucrats to learn constitutional values is to hold them liable if they if they break it, right? And so uh, if they will go to jail personally or have to pay a fine personally for a poor decision that they made, right? That incentivizes them to learn. Yeah, that's true. Behaviors. That's true. Behaviors. Okay, good. Uh, uh, we've got a question from another AU undergraduate, Sadie Yoder. How does the increasing political polarization in the U.S. today affect the administrative state? Uh, I think. Um... If go back to something I said previously, if the cleanest solution to some of the problems of administrative state would be a Congress that uh, delegates less or delegates uh, with tighter language, um, I think that is made all the more harder by polarization in Congress, right? And so to the extent that the parties and people are polarized and, and can't find any common ground, they're just going to be incapable of writing a statute that keeps firm control on the administrative state or writing any statute at all. Uh, and if they do, it would tend to be one that remains ambiguous if they manage to pass one. And then you're just replicating the problem again because the administrative state will take the ambiguity and the generality uh, and, and go their own way. So I think, I guess my answer is that it just intensifies that kind of problem uh, and makes it worse. And that the less you can accomplish in, in, in Congress, the more people are just going to default or punt to the actions of, of the bureaucrats. Okay, thank you. Here's a question from AU undergrad Dimitri Bolt. How is it possible to constitutionalize a body that has access to the power of the legislature, judiciary, and executive? Isn't it dangerous to set a precedent where a governmental body can have access to all three powers of government, something our founders fought to prevent, as long as they have oversight by other branches? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, uh, so when I when I talk about constitutionalization or to bring to bear constitutional principles uh, on the administrative state, uh, I think that's you know realistically where we're at as a polity, and I do think that each of the three branches has a role to play in doing that vis-a-vis -vis the, the the administrative agencies, the bureaucrats. Um, but I think maybe what the question is referencing is is the the problem of the mixing of powers within agencies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is a, a problem. And I think it's one uh, that more people increasingly are becoming less satisfied with, right? And to, so we, the idea is that you do want more separation between uh, people who investigate and people who prosecute and people who judge. Um, and so I, I think I would be in favor of that. But th it raises this this other question, which is, is deep, but... Um, I think is there is, you know, so why are agencies set up that way in the first place? Um, because, you know, the short answer is because they are executing a policy, right? Um, they're, they're not adjudicating a claim in or the right of an individual in the way that we would classically think of an Article Three court doing, right? And in some ways, that is the problem inherent in the very idea of a bureaucracy executing a policy. And so from that perspective, the idea of efficiency and doing it expeditiously and a deck stacked in favor of the policy that Congress on some level passed, well, that's a, an easy model to get your, your goal around if your, your job is to drive at this end of policy, right? And so the automatic tendency is to, to sublime, uh, sublimate or subordinate 
uh, process and, and rights because you got a job to do and that job is to regulate these people. And so the, in, there's some profound sense in which the deck, the deck is stacked uh, uh, against uh, what we would want to call constitutional values or the rights of individuals. And I think that's probably most evident in this problem of the mixing of the powers between them. And so it needs, you know, it, it needs to be addressed more than it has been. And so people talk about uh, um, um, amending or reforming the APA, that's one of the things that they mention. Thank you. We have a question now from my colleague in the public administration department, uh, Jocelyn Johnston. Could you address whether the administrative state uh, uh, would have happened without the Civil War? What about the unwillingness and inability of some states, the usual suspects, to address the economic crisis of the 20s, especially in view of the Civil War amendments and the post-Civil War weakening of the states? These are constitutional developments that one could argue facilitated the administrative state. The the uh, I'm not sure I'm quite grasping the the two components of the question coming together. That the 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 in the wake of the Civil War. Um, yeah, I I think the idea is that in the wake of the Civil War, with constitutional uh, reform in 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 the polity and states. Uh, not uh, honoring their uh, uh, constitutional requirements, right, in a way on a constitutional basis, right, uh, most specifically about race, which isn't mentioned in the question. So Jocelyn, I apologize if I'm taking this somewhere else. Um, uh, but she also talks about the economic crisis of the 20s, um, right, so that that there's something in the Constitution as it develops and and as it as it comes to be understood that maybe requires the rise or helps facilitate the rise of the administrative state yeah i mean i i guess i don't dispute the latter part of it i mean the the, the sort of racial component of it is is harder in the sense that you know the new dealers aren't dealing with race at all right yeah. and they so I, that that's that was i my addition to her question that's yeah no I, I mean i'll take up the other part of it which you know i, I have given some thought to and the the um <clears throat> uh i'll give you one example for that i know from some of my previous work on on constitutional politics constitutional contestation in the 19 uh 19 teens 1920s um, which is uh, Elihu Root, who was a, a senator uh, from New York um, uh, and a constitutional conservative um, uh, and a, a pretty serious thinker about these kinds of problems in this period, writing about these kind of things for decades. Um, and Root gives a speech pretty early on. I think it's in might be 1906, 1908, something like that. Um, uh, and and it's uh, it's in New York City, and to, there's sort of some constitutional conventions happening around the time in various states. And Root basically gets up and says, "Look, states are going to have to start dealing with the challenges of industrialization um, and urban society themselves, um, or uh, they are going to get run over by the federal government, uh, who is going to come and do it to them." Right. Uh, and so uh, I, I make that point to say that there are people at the time who are thinking about the, the problem that is put precisely in this way. Right. Um, and so uh, and, and Root uh, um, and, and other people at the time, there's this um, this movement um, to have uh, states agree interstate compacts um, for how they will deal with certain kinds of labor issues or regulatory issues again, as a way of getting states to sort of come together and get their own house in order so they don't get run over by the federal government. It basically fails and goes nowhere, right? So, I mean, I think there there is a, an unavoidable sense in which um, states uh, as states do not really take up the burden um, of, of adaptation on their own. I think that that's true. Okay. So thank you, Jocelyn. If I butchered your question, feel free to uh, to to submit something again. Um, okay, um, we have a question from Andrew Murray. Lots of scholars have discussed how a lot of agency behaviors are unconstitutional and need to be limited by the three branches: 
But aren't the branches just as unconstitutional? Is it not hypocritical to say judicial review is needed to limit unconstitutional behavior when judicial review itself is not even in the Constitution? Well, I mean, I could spend a while reciting Marbury versus Madison and, and you know, my argument of why I think Marshall's got a, a legitimate argument. Um, I mean, I, I think we, we, we'd have to excavate a long way back to get rid of judicial review. <laughs> um, and, and I don't, I mean, I don't, it, it might be uh, conceptually entertaining to do so, but I don't think it gets us very far uh, in the argument, certainly uh, today uh, or in the New Deal for that matter. Um, I mean, again, again, I, I guess I don't, <clears throat> uh, if we're concerned about the constitutional challenges or tensions um, presented by the administrative state, uh, whence do we go, <laughs> right? Uh, um, can, you know, where do we go? Uh, can we, are we going to, again, I mean, I, I said half jokingly, I mean, is it time to take up the barricades against uh, uh, the SEC or the EPA or, you know, I don't know, the, the, the Supreme Court building itself? I mean, I just don't think, you know, I think what we need to do is to take the raw materials and principles of the constitutional order and bring it to bear on and integrate them into the functioning of agencies as best as we are able. Uh, and and I think that, you know, it, although we may dislike various courts and various justice for various reasons, I think that the court, by wading back into this, is forcing this issue into the discussion um, in a way that it, it really didn't want much of a part of uh, for m most of the second half of the 20th century. Okay, thank you. We have a question from my colleague, Laura Field. What are the best defenses of the progressive slash living constitution? Hmm. Oh. <clears throat> hmm. I, I'm not actually a living constitution guy. Um, and uh, in, in, in a thing that I'm writing, I, you know, it's going to be a company probably to make a distinction between the notion of uh, adaptation or adjustment that that I'm floating and the, the kind of, uh, you know, Darwinian organismic notion of a living constitution. Um, I, I think uh, uh, um, the, the, the uh, best defense of the living constitution, um, <laughs> you know, is, is probably, you know, the, the Wilsonian uh, cum Hegelian, cum Her Darwinian attack that happened in the progressive era, right? Which is that um, you know, uh, natural rights and uh, are a bogey; they don't exist. Governments uh, adapt to to changes um, in a kind of more or less deterministic fashion, and it's time to change, right? And so, I actually don't really subscribe to that notion. Um, and you, you could understand what I'm doing is trying to offer some different understanding of constitutional adaptation that is actually not tied to the progressive living constitution notion. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I think what these two notions share is the, is the notion that, well, time is, to, to quote my dear departed mother, times change and people change, right? And, and that institutions uh, to adapt to profound social change have to change themselves, right? Uh, and I, I, I think that, that, that the progressive notion and the notion that I'm trying to articulate share that in common, but I don't, uh, want, I don't want to think that that necessarily puts me in the progressive living constitution box. Okay, we've got a couple of questions now uh, relating the, the things you've been talking about that we've been talking about to developments in current America. So I'll, I'll take them one at a one. One, one by one. The first is from our friend David Fott, a professor at UNLV. Does the administrative state promote the existence of populist demagogues in a unique way? If so, would any of the reforms you suggested counter that development? That's a good question. And and I I think um I think this is a, a version of the accountability problem, right? Um uh to the extent uh, that people feel like uh, government is powerful, distant, costly, interventionist, unresponsive, uh, descriptors that not infrequently have been applied to bureaucracies, um, 
I think it does uh, have a tendency to instigate a uh, populist anti anti institutional uh, gestalt, right? Um, so I think that that seems to me a decent line of analysis, um, um, which you could say makes um, it all the more incumbent upon sane constitutionalists to try to attend to some of these problems, right? Uh, in a way that does not recur to these these more uh, uh, dangerous and destructive forms of political engagement. Um, and so, I mean, to, to the extent that some of the things I'm floating would conduce to more accountability, uh, I, I think the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Another question from Laura Field related to modern politics. Do you have any thoughts about the tensions between factions on the so-called new right on the question of the administrative state? I'm thinking of Vermeil, uh, uh, post-liberals versus the Claremont folks following Marini and others. And maybe you could say what that difference is there if if you're able. And Yeah, uh, I mean, um, so uh, some, some people, uh, uh, and I think John Marini is one of them. And I've actually learned a lot about the administrative state from from John Marini and 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 uh, R.J. Pastrito and and others. They I, they emphasize strongly the notion that this is a kind of a uh, a a sort of decayed Hegelian statism that progressives bring into American constitutional discourse and practice. Uh, in, in the early 20th century. And I, I think that there, there is a German connection in this way in the education of these people and in the way that, you know, Woodrow Wilson and other people think about the nature of the state and the nature of bureaucracy. I mean, I think that is undeniable. Um, I uh, And so I, I think that some people want to say then that the administrative state is therefore an, an utterly alien uh, and, and dangerous force that has to be extirpated root and branch. And, and and while I find it troubling and dissatisfying in many ways, I just think it's 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 unrealistic to expect that kind of, of destruction of something that we've had for so long. I also think that uh, 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 all of the people involved in its in its creation and elaboration and constraint and limitation aren't just you know beholden to Woodrow Wilson or or some Hegelian status tradition. I don't think it's entirely accurate to say that. Um, so I think that the people who who want most to destroy the administrative state um, m today more radically are informed by that that description of it, which I think has elements of truth in it, but probably goes too far. Um, now, this is complicated by the fact that, you know, people like Trump and many kind of post-liberal people like uh, 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 Patrick Deneen and uh, and some others are actually fans of some of the administrative state, right? And and certainly some of the, the, uh, the social welfare components of it, but also would use the power of the state, you know, to, to regulate Sunday blue laws or parental leave paternal leave in particular, other kinds of things that you don't classically associate with an anti-state as conservative. So, I mean, I think that, that that both of those things are out there and they're contending with one another and they don't, these components of the right, I mean, I think the questioner is accurate to, to say that these components of the contemporary right don't necessarily match up with each other on their understanding of the administrative state, right? Um, and I think that that, uh, that that is one to watch for. And it's one of the things actually that Trump did uh, which shook things out most significantly is he he had a different set of enemies lists right but he didn't say and he actually said i'm not going to go after your social security right and workers compensation uh and medicaid benefits right and so that th that has very much uh shaken things up on the right in relation to the state and, and its purposes and its reach okay thank you this is from my colleague tom merrill uh, thanks for this very clear explanation of the issues in the history, Jonathan. One striking thing about recent years is that the administrative state has become a significant flashpoint in the culture wars. Why do you think that is? Has the administrative state on the whole contributed to overall civic health or not? I... 
it, you know, I, some of these, that, that kind of question is similar to earlier questions. And sometimes I feel like we would, we're asking these people to offer a defense of themselves or to have a kind of political voice that, that uh, I just don't see them around, right, having uh, in our history. Um, and, and, you know, maybe they should, maybe we, we should make moves in that direction. But I, I see it being more about the fact that we are worried about conceding so much power to them without a clear enough, a public enough, a politically astute enough understanding of what they do and what the limitations on them are. So I actually think a lot of people who want to open both barrels against the administrative state, if you went to uh, their their bank account, their workplace, uh, their commute and said, let me list for you the number of ways in which you benefit from interfacing with the administrative state in ways that you can't even understand, maybe your your estimation of it would be better, right? And and that maybe that is the political project uh, that needs work. So I don't. So that I think that is a different project of broadcasting what the the administrative state what we wanted to do and what it contributes to our lives, that's a different kind of political project than the project of accountability and constitutional discipline, right? And maybe that, that, that the, the, the project of accountability and constitutional discipline would be welcomed more and made easier if more people understood that functionally, ends-wise, we want this thing to do a lot of what it does. And we actually want the ability to, to tell it not to do some of the things that it does uh, by virtue of recourse to constitutional principles. And again, that's not the same thing as dismissing it all to court. So I think it does contribute to civic hygiene and necessary governance um, in a way that needs to be more made more legible to people, but also in a way that can, on the other side of the coin, have more accountability when we want to draw limits on it. So, so as part of your answer to that question about why it's a flashpoint in the culture wars because of ignorance and misinformation among the critics? Think, I think, and, and just a misunder, or, or no real true knowledge of the extent to which we are involved with and want it and like it. Yeah. So, so the answer- so, so the political, the political victory of people who want to destroy it is to just make it seem as if it's this, this alien intervention that does nothing but abuse you and, and reach into your pocket, which I just think a lot of times it does do, but a lot of times it does not do, right? Yeah. So the answer to your first question was educate better the bureaucrats. And your your answer to this question is educate better the populace, right? Yeah. So education. <laughs> Why we're professors. What right? are we going to do? We're professors, right? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so I, I've got a, 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 a few more questions here, late additions by students. Um, so I'll ask you to go quickly on these, and then I'll ask one question as an exit. So this is from an AU grad student, Timothy McLaughlin. If the constitution is vague on the capacity of administrative rules, did they intend for that to be the case? And if the legislature felt there was an overreach, uh, could they intervene? I, I mean, I think the constitution um, uh, is intentionally vague uh, in a number of ways that conduce to the creation of the administrative state. And that the, the Congress does have the capacity by access to its other pow powers to uh, um, to regulate all kinds of things. Um, and the problem is that when it does so, it typically does so too vaguely and, and, and with too much generality, it doesn't revisit these things. And that the, the, the best assertion of its authority would be to regulate uh, more discreetly and to cl claw back some of what is regulated already. And I think Congress constitutionally very much has the power to do those things. Okay. This is, if that one was on the Congress, this one's on the judiciary. Between the administrative state and the judiciary, which one has administered slash ruled the law more fairly? In other words, with less bias away from political ideology. Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's a, that's a, a tough question. Um, I, I guess I mean, I would say in the whole sweep of American history, probably uh, the judiciary. Um, I, I think that, that administrative agencies are given a remit and a job to do, and they attempt to do it. And the problem increasingly is that they overstep that job, right? Um, so, you know, and, and much of the, you know, 
many people starting in the New Deal and earlier say the way to discipline the overreach of agencies is judicial review, right? Uh, and that that the, that the ultimate access uh, to agency misbehavior or overreach has got to be the courts. And I, I think I put some stock in that. I mean, I'm not a judicial supremacy person either, but I, I think that, you know, one way to, to ratchet back on the administrative state is for the court to take a closer look at what it does. Okay. Thank you. So we have a question now from uh, an AU graduate student visiting from Germany, Lars Jungling Dahlhoff. You outlined that globalization requires more regulation as problems have become more complex and also got more uh more, you know, more is there any way to tackle these multi-dimensional and more complex problems without an increase in bureaucracy? Um, I, I guess it becomes, I mean, in the American federal context, I know there's a German federal context too. I mean, I think it becomes a question of how willing we are as a society uh, to have varying local regulatory regimes, right? Um, of of issues, I mean, some issues you can't because they are are truly uh, interstate, international. Uh, but there are, you know, some things. I think we could maybe summon some examples in which you know technology these days permits states to go their own way on a variety of things, right? Um, and so uh, it, it isn't. Maybe my answer to that question is it isn't. I don't think necessarily inevitable to have a centralized bureaucracy ruling over all policy domains that I think in some on some topics it's possible to diffuse discretion uh, and decision making to a more local level, which would inevitably cause some disjunctures between the way that those regulatory regimes look at a local or a state level. OK, so now to, as a final uh, wrap up question, I, I want to ask about Congress and its fecklessness. A lot of this is Congress passing the buck, right? Uh, you you refer to this Congress doesn't want to um, antagonize uh, members of Congress don't want to antagonize any of their constituents. So rather than make a decision and piss somebody off, they'd rather not make a decision and piss nobody off, and then they can complain with whoever complains. Oh yeah, it's those bureaucrats who did it, right? So AU undergrad asks. What incentives could provoke Congress to take up greater authority and moderation when the existence of the administrative state proves so beneficial? And, and here, I want to suggest a particular uh, idea, and that is, um, um, why couldn't Congress create bureau more bureaucracy in Congress, right? So insofar as the administrative agencies have to further articulate general laws into more precise language and work out problems. That's more or less a legislative idea, right? Interpreting the legislature. Why couldn't an, a, Congress create an agency within the congressional branch, the legislative branch, to do that part of the work and then have a, an agency in the executive branch that given those rules spelled out in that way, that other agency, their job is to just carry it out. Yeah, I mean, this is a plausible notion. Um, it, it, it reminds me of others I've heard in discussions like this that, you know, Congress needs um, something like the, the, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel in the executive branch, which is a constitutional sort of, of law office in the executive branch. Well, Congress needs something like that to help it think about constitutional issues in the legislative branch. And I think there, there's some, you know, you could say something similar about the, the problems presented uh, by the administrative state and that it, you know, uh, and I think what it, it would call, it would require some sort of delay on the effectuation of a regulation Right. That is proposed bef before people in Congress in, in this kind of, of, of situation could could have their own sniff at it and evaluation of it. Right. And so then you run then you're an interferer. Right. From the perspective of the bureaucracy and it becomes less efficient and less expeditious. And here, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I would side with you know David Rosenblum and others who said that might be just the kind of price we need to pay for accountable constitutional government is is a little bit more delay 
uh, it, and and a little bit more inefficiency so that we can satisfy ourselves that that there's accountability in the rule of law. Oh, well, that's a great place to end. So, Jonathan, thank you very much for discussing these these complicated issues that everybody is aware of, but nobody knows what to do about. So thank you. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you, everyone, for the questions okay. as well. And thank you, everybody. Thank Jack Miller Center for your support. Thank you all for your questions. And we'll see you next time. Bye, all. Bye-bye.